Thank you again, everyone, for coming. See, I want to I, I want to start by thanking Michael uh, for thanking him for actually letting us ho letting me and letting us uh, hold this gathering. Uh, one of Michael's most notable attributes, and it's been mentioned time and time again, is his moderation. And uh, Michael, I know you well enough to know that though a little bit of attention is fine, a, a lot is not. Um, and I, I'm sure this whole event has made you somewhat uncomfortable. But it's actually very important for us to honor you, because in doing so, we learn, and especially the, the young, learn what is honorable. So we do this for you, but you let us do it for us. So thank you. I, um, so I have three things to say. That was the first. Uh, the second is, uh, more on a personal note, uh, just to let you know, Michael, how much uh, we will miss you and, and I will miss you. Um, everyone here knows about your scholarship and about your devotion to teaching. We've heard a lot about that. Um, not maybe everyone knows how terrific of a colleague you are. Uh, you're generous with your time. Um, I say my deepest regret uh, all day today was not having spent more time with you. Um, uh, I, I hope we'll still have the chance. Um, you open your classes to us, uh, you open your house to us, uh, you're wonderful in conversation. You're an institution builder. Uh, I'm here because more than 10 years ago, Michael spent a lot of time writing a National Endowment for the Humanities grant. Uh, I've come to know how much work that is. <laughs> and, and Michael gets nothing for it. Well, he gets me, well, good or bad. <laughs> uh, but I've certainly learned recently how much time it takes to help to build something. And I'm only here to help you do it because you spent that time originally. Uh, that is, in our, little com in our little world, that is what devotion to the common good looks like. And so I thank you for your building of uh, Notre Dame. Uh, you are leaving this place a much better place than it was when you arrived. Uh, I'm going to miss having you around. Uh, Michael's office was just down the hall from mine, and um, uh, now I saw less of him when they changed the parking and he had to walk farther. <laughs> but when he was around all the time, uh, my favorite interaction was, was this, and I, and I do not exaggerate, this happened at least 20 times. I would be perplexed on a text or um, how to teach something. I remember not being able to figure out, you know, I've been thinking about this for 20 years, what is it? Or, Book one, chapter two of Aristotle's Politics, The Naturalness of the Polis. I mean, how do I teach that? I don't even know what that means, right? Um, Lincoln's Perpetuation Address, you know, political religion, does he really mean this? Uh, Woodrow Wilson, Publius on Federalism. And I'd go to Michael and I'd say, how, you know, how do you teach this? Uh, how, do, how do you understand this? And his response was always like, oh, I have this unpublished essay I wrote on this. You should read it. <laughs> I have a whole collection. I have a file called Zucker Unpublished with all these. Those essays are great. And I've learned a lot. I've learned things you haven't learned because of them. Um, so I'm going to miss having you around. I'm going to miss having you down the hall. Um, I've learned a lot just by being next to you, uh, being your colleague. I've learned most most of all, what it means to have a vocation to be a college professor. So thank you. One last, one last note. Uh, and this is to you and Catherine. Um, I hope you know this, you should know this. Uh, Notre Dame is your home. It's been your home for a long time, and it remains your home. Uh, while you remain here in South Bend, I hope you'll, you'll be a part of our intellectual life. Come to the seminars. Tell me who to invite, as I'm sure you will. <laughs> Teach a class. You could be our most distinguished adjunct. <laughs> you have so much more to offer and more work to do, and I hope you'll do some of that work with us here at Notre Dame. We remain your family, 
and Notre Dame remains your home. So I hope you'll join me uh, in toasting Michael Sarah. It is uh, a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Laura Tiedens. Tiedens. Uh, Laura is, uh, you know, uh, believe it or not, the most distinguished member of the Zucker family. <laughs> she's currently president of Scripps College, where she's been since 2016. She, holds, uh, she also holds the title there of the W.M. Keck Pres Presidential Chair. Before coming uh, to Scripps, before becoming Scripps' president, she was senior associate dean of academic affairs and faculty member of the Stanford University Graduate School of Business, where she oversaw um, Stanford's edu key educational and administrative functions, including a PhD program, executive education, and their global inno innovation program. Uh, but tonight, uh, President Tiedens joins us in a different capacity. She's one of three daughters of Michael and Catherine Zuckert, and she's going to offer a few words uh, about her father. Uh, please join me in welcome, welcoming Professor Tiedens. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, about three years ago, I was at an event actually at Scripps with my dad, and he said, we, there was this guy who came up to make remarks, and he didn't bring any pieces of paper with him to the podium and said he brought an iPad. And my dad said he was really impressed by this. So here I am, still trying to impress you, Dad. I, I hope this will do it, okay. Uh, this is actually that in true Michael Zuckert form, I didn't write these comments soon enough to print them, that's all. <laughs> okay, so I'm Laura, and I'm Michael and Catherine's middle daughter. That makes me their second born. And I know mostly out there you are political philosophers, and so you may not be up on the psychological findings regarding birth order. <laughs> But I'm a psychologist, and so let me just fill you in. And the long and the short of it is that second-borns are rebels. And the basic idea of this is that second-borns very quickly realize that they're not going to win at the same game as the first-born. So instead of trying to impress the parents on the things the parents care the most about, which is what the first-born does, the second-born goes on her own path, a very different one than the first or than the parents. Now, given Phil's introduction of me, I understand that I may not look like your prototypic rebel, but this is really my role in the family. And if we had longer time tonight, my parents could give you many, many examples of my rebellious behavior. But thankfully for me, we're not here to talk about me. I see tonight as really about celebrating the breadth, depth, and impact of my father's incredible career. And this is a problem for me, the rebel, because I'm really the least equipped of truly anybody in his immediate family to talk about his career. I do not know a single thing about political philosophy. My daughter, Michael's oldest grandchild, who shares his fascination with the political philosophy underlying this country's founding would have been a far better choice. And she truly wishes she could be here to share this night with you. Unlike me, she actually would have gone to all the talks today. She would have enjoyed them and she would now be asking you all questions about what you said. And truly, she is probably the only girl who is a 13-year-old who wrote her high school application to the essay prompt of who would you like to be for the day, saying that she would like to be Thomas Jefferson <laughs> contemplating the ideal government for a new country. <laughs> who would have ever given her that notion? Now, Another one of the options would have been one of my sisters. 
And in fact, one of my sisters said that if she spoke, she was going to talk about how political philosophy or particular political philosophers could be evidence in the parenting approach of, of Michael Zuckert. And I thought she quite generously offered that I could pick up on this theme. And what I would say to you is that that would have had the benefit that I would have spoken to you for a much shorter period of time than I'm going to, but I couldn't riff on that for even a single second, so sorry. Okay, so what might I be able to say appropriate to the occasion, not just about him as a father, but really about him as a scholar and teacher? Well, first let me start by saying that my knowledge of him outside of the professional realm is completely generalizable. Because as I'm sure many of you know, this man is exactly the same at home, in the office, in a lecture, in the classroom, walking around campus, on the elliptical machine, wherever he is. He, oh, sorry, he does his thing. He brings his sense of self, how about that? Is that better? Good, okay, good, for me too, okay. All right, he brings his sense of self to really everything that he does, whether it's professional, whether it's in his family, or whether it's for fun. And by the way, I think one of the really distinguishing characteristics of him is that you can never really disentangle those things because he doesn't either. Well. Many of you may know that my father did most of the cooking in our household growing up. And as a side note, I will say that one of his secret or not so secret sort of points of pride is that now all of his daughters are married to husbands who also do all the cooking in their homes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that he sees himself as having raised feminist empowered women one dinner at a time. <laughs> anyway, my dad's way of being was even on display when he made meatloaf for dinner. Yeah, meatloaf. He never made it as a loaf. <laughs> Instead, he would mold it into some bizarre shape in honor of the holiday that was coming up, a movie we had just seen, a recent news event, a character from a book that he had been reading to us at night. Now I know, many of you probably have not eaten his meatloaf, much less seen the shapes of it, but you probably relate to this example because you've seen that same knack for making connections between the various pieces of life, finding a way to be silly about it in, other, in your own interactions with him like those weird prizes he gives out in class, or examples or film clips he'd work into his lectures or writing, or his funny little giggle or that full throttle laugh at stupid jokes or even at a cartoon in the newspaper. All of us in the room, whether we know each other or not, we know this guy, we know that same guy. And one of the things that makes him so compelling is that he is him everywhere and anywhere. Now, as the rebel, I'll tell you that that guy was really embarrassing sometimes, <laughs> but it's also why it's easy to connect over a love for him. Okay, but what I really wanna focus on in my comments is the way that my dad spoiled me. Now, I'm not actually saying that as his daughter exactly, because I'm not saying that he didn't have rules, because he absolutely did or that he didn't punish us, because he did that too. I was, got grounded more than I think any of my other sisters. Uh, or that he didn't hold us accountable, he did that too. Or that he didn't require that we be responsible, because he did that too. He spoiled me on a much deeper level. He spoiled me about the most fundamental expectations about the life worth leading, about what a profession is, about what learning is, about the value of ideas, the power of a good argument, the necessity of reasoning, and also about what a father should be, how a husband can be, and what men are really capable of. In all of these realms, 
He set the standards so high. He made such extreme ideals the norm that some days I feel he set me up for disappointment. And that's what I mean by spoiling. He spoiled my idea of what is possible. I've heard my dad tell a story from Carleton at a graduation event where he told the mother of one of his very best students that year what a great paper the student had written. I think it was on Tocqueville, but I'm not sure. Yeah? Rob. OK. I don't know my political philosophy. I told you that. OK, the mother was you know, glad to hear this about her son. But she then said, well, but who's going to pay my son to have great ideas about Tocqueville? My dad's response was delivered in a tone that I'm sure you all know, that sort of innocent kind of, but really all-knowing, pretending to take on a sort of puzzled, why might you ask that question, and yet so very clear in his answer. And he said, you don't think about Tocqueville to be paid. You find a way to get paid to have the opportunity to think about Tocqueville. All right, well, my dad obviously did figure out how to be paid for thinking about Tocqueville. <laughs> and a lot of other things. But more importantly, the value of thought is a central theme to the story of his life. And getting there, finding that life, and leading that life does not seem to have been a puzzle for him, or at least he never showed it to be. I think the thing about him is that he truly lives the life he sees worth leading. He values that focus on the importance of ideas and thoughtfulness, while also truly enjoying people, art, invention, and creation. He's one of those few people who lives purely, completely, and vigorously, taking in everything he sees as great, doing it in full, he does what he loves, and he loves what he does, and he shows that to us at every turn. One of the greatest powers, I think, that parents have is that they define your sense of what's normal. And my dad led me to believe that living in that manner that he does is normal. Coming from my parents' home, I thought that all professors had their students over to their houses all the time. I thought that all professors wrote endless comments on papers. I thought all professors read work from their discipline for fun. <laughs> I thought that all academics talked about what they were reading and that all academics wanted to know more and think more even when it was harder to do so. I thought that in academia, but not just in academia, really actually in life, that it was all about playing with ideas all day long and in all contexts. Whether that's about Machiavellian themes under the Tuscan sun, naming your cats for characters in Greek tragedies, teaching your daughter calculus, or engaging your five and seven-year-olds on the meaning of being in nothing. <laughs> yes, I did have that conversation with him as a five-year-old in Claremont, California, and I still remember him asking whether nothing could actually be nothing if there we were talking about it, and so it must be something, mustn't it? I thought that's just how life was. Now, to those of you in the room who were Michael's students, either as graduate students or undergraduate students, I see you as a kind of sibling. I believe I share with you a love and appreciation for the very special way in which he has shaped my life and also that pride and warmth of having been touched and raised by someone of a unique and better character. But if I'm honest, I've also had some sibling jealousy and resentment toward you. <laughs> because it is really easy to see how much of his heart and mind you occupy, and it's forever been that way. But our similar experiences with him may have also resulted in some similarities in our journeys. I know I spent many years of my life seeking that same magic that my parents create around them wherever they go. Whether in Minnesota, Chicago, DC, England, Delaware, South Bend, or now in Phoenix, 
They create an environment where there is simply no alternative to the relentless pursuit of thinking for the pure joy of it. For me, for some time, I was disappointed that I couldn't ever find that Zuckert alternative universe anywhere else that I went. I kept looking for it. It was how I evaluated every professor, every department, every school, every job, and even friends and possible romantic partners. Just everything. I couldn't understand why that was so not graspable for me when it seemed to come so easily and naturally in every room that my dad entered. My guess is, is that there are a number of people in this room who relate to that quest, and they may even blame my dad for generating it, as I sometimes have. But lately, I'm over my disappointment, and I'm over my jealousy, because it finally occurred to me that all that spoiling, all those raising of expectations, all that illustration of an ideal, was actually getting me the experience I was seeking. I got to be in their alternative universe. I got to see that it could and does exist, if not everywhere, somewhere. And now I can just call or email, Skype or FaceTime, or go visit and get a fix of it. Lots of people I know don't ever even see it, not even once. And I know it exists, I've gotten to live it, I can aspire to it, and so I've got a piece of that beautiful alternative universe. And I think that all of you do too, and that that's why you're here tonight, and that's why even I, knowing nothing about political philosophy, can celebrate his amazing career. Well, that's the natural place to stop, but I have one last thing to say. Last night, my dad said up at this podium that he's very mixed feelings about retirement, and whoever it was this afternoon who mentioned eulogies did not help that situation at all. <laughs> But we all understand why he would have these mixed feelings, especially him. He has an energy, and not just an energy, but a drive and a passion for engaged thinking that really doesn't comport with the way that many of us, and maybe particularly he, thinks about retirement. Now, to be sure, he's not going to spend his retirement golfing, or in a lawn chair, or on a cruise, or even designing new meatloaf shapes. So I hope he will make some meatloaf, because beyond being shaped in interesting ways, it also tastes pretty good. Indeed, it's really so him that the only way he would retire is because he had another teaching gig. <laughs> but what I want to say to this group, and really most importantly to you, Dad, is that just like you redefine the good life, the life of the mind, the quest for better thinking for probably all of us here, I'm pretty sure you're going to redefine retirement for yourself and by happy accident for all the rest of us too. You are going to be that same you in retirement. And that means you're going to keep doing all the great things you do just without all those annoying administrators around. <laughs> Unless you count me. Because I'm an annoying administrator. That's the rebel in me. <laughs> and I want part of it. I want part of this new alternative universe, the one you will create, the one I know you will woo us all into, as you always do. And this time, I promise, I won't see it as being spoiled. I won't see it as a disappointment. I just want a taste of all the great stuff that waits, awaits. So dad, congratulations on the enormous impact that you've had. Best wishes for the many next chapters you will write, and thank you. Susan Collins needs no introduction uh, to this group. Uh, I first met Sue when uh, I was in my first year of graduate uh, school at Boston College, 
Uh, I met Sue when she would translate Chris Rule's lectures to me. <laughs> a, a few years ago, um, when the department here foresaw a need in classical, classical political theory, uh, we were absolutely thrilled, uh, and I personally was thrilled when we were able to recruit Sue to, to join uh, the department here at Notre Dame. Uh, she's a penetrating scholar, a terrific teacher, uh, and very much a trusted and dear friend. Um, Sue is going to introduce uh, Catherine. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Sue Collins to the podium. So, for the record, this is not an iPad. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I am Sue Collins. A uh, faculty member here in political science at Notre Dame, and more importantly for this evening, colleague and friend of Catherine Zuckert, whom I'm to introduce. Now, <clears throat> when Phil Munoz asked me to make this introduction, I, I have to confess that I tried to squirm out of it. <laughs> Not because I didn't want to introduce Catherine, but because I could think of several other people and suggested several other people who would do a better job. Besides, I said to Philip, there is no way that I could compete with his introduction of Michael Zuckert two years ago, which, as many of you know who were there, was very funny. And Phil's response was, but that's why I'm asking you, because you're funny. So apparently, my sole qualification for introducing Catherine is that I'm funny. Not my long-standing friendship with her, not my distinguished or somewhat distinguished academic record, uh, not even my beautiful, as everyone keeps saying about Mayor Pete, baritone voice. No, my qualification is my comedic talent. But after I agreed and hung up the phone, I realized what a ridiculous idea all this was because at the heart of it was the proposition that I write a light-hearted after-dinner speech about Catherine Zuckert. So, you know, it's a piece of cake to be funny when you're introducing Michael. I mean, he regularly pokes fun at himself, for goodness sakes. But anyone who knows Catherine knows not only her extraordinary intellect, academic achievements, but also her profound gravitas. Perhaps the funniest thing to say about Catherine is that, well, she's married to Michael. <laughs> So two years ago, at our celebration of Catherine's distinguished career, I ran into an old friend of Michael and Catherine's from their days at Cornell, who told me what a shock it was to their friends during that time when the news got around that Catherine and Michael were dating. Catherine, she told me, was this serious workaholic, always hitting the books, hardly ever coming up for air, and Michael, Kind of a goofy, her words, not mine. Not a ne'er-do-well, exactly, but <laughs> nowhere near as intellectually committed and hardworking. <laughs> it's called a reading party, she'd tell them. I mean, who makes a six-year-old or five-year-old read Hegel? I mean, the, the best you can say, the best you can say is, at least it wasn't Strauss. <laughs> Now, many of you, perhaps all of you, know Catherine as a scholar and a teacher. I do not think that I need to list her many publications and awards. A few of us know Catherine as a colleague in addition. 
And at the risk of making Catherine feel, as she said, at her own celebration, that she's like Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer come back just in time to hear the eulogies at their funeral, I'd like to say a few words about what she has meant to us in that capacity. As we all pretty much know, the Academy today has become something of a fractured place. If we didn't know it, we surely were uh, made aware of it at the first two panels this morning. And one might say that just as in professional sports, the successes or metrics of the Academy are now frequently based on the number of high-flying free agents we can manage to attract, or even that choose to reject us. But there remain, in my experience, scholars and teachers who are, in addition to their scholarly achievements, also dedicated institution builders, departmental citizens, and fair-minded, even, dare I say, humane colleagues. And these qualities are true of Catherine in spades. Those of us who have worked closely with her, either as a colleague in the field or on the review of politics, as I'm sure our editorial coordinator, coordinator Ke Kelly Brown would attest, have come to know not only her intellectual and editorial skills, but also her dedication to the best traditions of the academy as a collegium and her genuine humanity in her relations with faculty, colleagues, staff, and students. It's not just, I would say, that Catherine avoids gratuitous cruelty. <laughs> and certainly, given her close study of Machiavelli, she's something of an expert on cruelty well used. It's rather that she does not forget that the other person on the other side of the desk or the wall or the war is a human being worthy of respect and consideration. Sometimes the importance of this kind of humanity gets lost in the vanity fair of the academy. And indeed, it is a quality that she shares also in spades with Michael. I am certain that both Michael and Catherine have attracted such a loyal following of students, colleagues, and friends, because in each of them there is combined intellectual depth, extraordinary wit, and a profound humanity. And like Michael, for all her daunting academic achievements, Catherine has retained a wonderful sense of humor. One way I know this is that she almost always laughs at my jokes. <laughs> Another piece of evidence is, well, that she did marry Michael. <laughs> but the clearest evidence is that she has survived a long, and distinguished academic career with her sanity largely intact. And as was said last night, it's not surprising that I should come around to speaking of both Zuckerts while speaking of one Zuckert. But this evening, we are fortunate to hear from one Zuckert about the other Zuckert. So without further ado, I ask you to welcome our colleague and friend, Catherine Zuckert, to speak about our friend and colleague, Michael Zuckert. Well, I've already complained about being last, so we <laughs> could go through that. We're gathered here, this sounds like a marriage ceremony at the beginning, um, to celebrate Michael Zuckert's career as a scholar and teacher. Today we heard three panel discussions of three of the major topics of Michael's research. Liberal political philosophy, natural rights in the American regime, and the political philosophy of Leo Strauss. And I think it became perfectly clear in the panels, if it was not clear before, 
that there is a certain tension at the heart. Oh, okay, thank you. See, I have an ep. <laughs> um, there's a tension at the center of Michael's research, if not of his thought. And that is the tension between his genuine attachment to liberal political philosophy and the American regime on the one hand, and his admiration for Strauss on the other. Strauss was, after all, a critic of modern liberal political philosophy, even though he thought that modern liberal democracies constituted the best possible form of regime in contemporary circumstances. Although Michael is loyal to his teacher, and has defended Strauss's work against much unfair, inaccurate criticism. It is clear that he has staked out his own position. The students are, of course, the best and most reliable witnesses to Michael's skill and de dedication to his vocation as a teacher. But you have heard from them at lunch, and I will not attempt to improve on their moving testimony. I will try instead to do what I am perhaps uniquely qualified to do. That is to describe the development of Michael's career from the beginning to this day. I will not say from the beginning to the end because Michael's career hasn't come to an end. He retired from the University of Notre Dame on December 31st, 2018. We had already moved to Arizona. But he has not ceased teaching or writing nor, I expect, will he stop. In planning this conference, Philip Munoz invited Michael to give an overview of his work before the opening reception. But Michael refused. He thought such a talk would bore people, evidence to the contrary, and make him sound as if he were bragging. Bragging about one's husband is, however, one of the few prerogatives of a wife. So here I am. When I asked Philip what sort of talk he had in mind for this evening, he said that he thought I was uniquely qualified to give the inside story. Well, sorry, if you, if you think you're going to get something really salacious now, I mean, you're going to be disappointed. It's true that I'm very serious. Um, but Phil's questions were, what do I find most lovable about Michael? There's maybe a little skepticism in that. And can I give some illustrious, sorry, illustrative examples or amusing anecdotes to be determined? It didn't take me much time to decide that one of the things I have most loved about Michael is his desire and ability to discuss a wide range of ideas. That is, of course, the quality that makes him such a wonderful teacher. But it was also a characteristic that distinguished him greatly from most of the young men I dated before we married. <laughs> Michael was willing not only to tell me what he thought about a great many subjects, political, philosophical, historical, artistic, scientific, he didn't tutor me in mathematics. That was for our daughter. He was also, however, and more unusually, interested in listening to what I had to say. It didn't hurt, of course, that he was tall, dark, and handsome. But those are qualities, at least in my experience, much more common than Michael's intellectual breadth and depth. So let me give two examples of how unusual Michael's conversational skills appear to others. The first is my mother. Mothers-in-law are not always praising of the men their daughters marry. And my mother was no exception to that rule. <laughs> she frequently complained that Michael had never learned to pick anything up and put it away. Nevertheless, I remember our city talking one evening after dinner in Northfield, Minnesota, when she exclaimed, I feel as if I've been transported to ancient Athens. She was a great admirer of the Greeks. She thought I had married my own Socrates. I'm just hoping she didn't know about Santippe. <laughs> but to take an example a little bit further from home, 
In 1993, Michael and I spent spring semesters visiting scholars at the Social Philosophy and Policy Center at Bowling Green, Ohio. The center was run by three professors, Fred Miller and Jeff Paul in philosophy and Ellen Frankel Paul in political science. They are very strong libertarians. So there wasn't much social interaction at this center. <laughs> Fred, Jeff, and Ellen came into the old house where the center was located occasionally, but one could not simply walk upstairs, knock on the door, and ask to chat. One had to send an email message or put a note in the mailboxes on the first floor to set up an appointment. The culinary or um, other resources of Bowling Green, as you might imagine, were not so great. So Michael and I often brought lunch to eat in the kitchen of this old house. One day, Ellen's walking through the kitchen on her way to play tennis, and she turns around and she looks at us and she says, how long have you been married? At that point, it was 27 years, I think. And her comment was, what on earth can the two of you still have to talk about? <laughs> Talking has never been a problem. <laughs> but the topics have changed over time. One question about which Michael and I initially disagreed, but have since resolved, sort of, was when exactly we met. I thought I had encountered this man first in an honor seminar we took as juniors at Cornell University. I had taken courses primarily in comparative and international relations. He studied American politics. I didn't remember ever having talked to him. As far as I know, he was the only undergraduate I had ever met who already had salt and pepper hair. <laughs> Michael has nevertheless convinced me with an argument as cogent as this geometric proof that we were in the same freshman composition class. <laughs> I remembered the instructor, who's an expert on Dante, Professor Durling, and I also remembered that we read a collection of essays including some by George Orwell, and The Modern Temper by Joseph Kruch. Michael and I nevertheless could have been in different sections of this required course. We also happened to have taken the same chemistry course our freshman year. But when you're in a lecture of 300 people, you don't notice the other people there, and we weren't in the same lab. How he convinced me that we were, in fact, in the same course was, he asked, did I remember that we're four and only four women in this course of about 25 students? I did remember that fact. <laughs> I was one. My friend and I, Bobby Sherwatt, we sat usually in the fourth or the fifth row. But the real evidence was there were two other women. One was fairly big and rotund. The other was this little bitty woman whose name was Miss Atlas. Who could forget Miss Atlas, named after the guy who had the world on his shoulders? So I couldn't take a great deal of pride in the fact that with that gender imbalance, he had noticed my presence in the class. <laughs> and I didn't think that he was terribly insulted that I had not noticed him slouching in the back. <laughs> Because it was after mechanical drawing, or um, so it's machine drawing and mechanical arts, machine tools and mechanical drawing. Okay, so I take it on faith that he was dozing. As the reference to machine tools indicates, Michael began college as a student of engineering physics. None of the students here will be surprised to learn that he quickly became restive in a curriculum that did not allow him to pursue his interests in literature and poetry. So Michael is not a shy fellow, as you know. So he went to see the Dean of Engineering of the College of Engineering and Physics. And he said, I want to transfer. I want to transfer into the College of Arts and Sciences so I can major in physics and I can drop all this engineering stuff. The Dean said to him, or so Michael tells me, who do you think you are? 
Hans Bethe, he was the Nobel Prize winning <laughs> physicist at Cornell. Michael was not cowed. He transferred. But as you all know, he didn't end up majoring in physics or chemistry or poetry or literature. He was in government. By the time he graduated from Cornell, Michael had become what he has dubbed a blossom. That is a budding student of Alan Bloom. <laughs> and in the fall of 1964, he and I joined nine other Cornellians in a cohort of 75 students beginning graduate study in political science at the University of Chicago. And we were joined there the next year by 10 or 11 more people from Cornell. Although Michael took courses primarily in theory and con law, he continued to take seminars in American politics. And his interest in America not only gained him a double stipend his first year, that was probably an administrative mistake, but <laughs> <laughs> it also enabled him to snag his first job which was a late opening replacement position in urban politics at Carleton College. The man who hired Michael was not fooled in the slightest by Michael and Ted Lowy's, he was placement director's attempt to cast him as an urbanist. <laughs> Ralph Yelstead saw that Michael's expertise was in theory and con law. He also saw that Michael had done enough work in American to enable him to teach the six courses they needed the following year. And in parentheses, among other things, Michael spent one summer while he was in graduate school working on a study of the most successful school integration efforts conducted by the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago for the US Civil Rights Commission. And the head of the commission at that time was none other than Theodore J. Hesburgh. And Michael learned something about the character of government reports when the commission flew all the researchers to Washington, D.C. and told them at the end of the summer what their findings were going to be before they had submitted them. But to return to my main story, the primary reason Ralph hired Michael was that he knew the man teaching theory and con law at Carleton was going to retire the year afterwards. So he thought he could hire Michael. Michael could replace um, the man in urban for a year. And then they could recruit a real urbanist the next year. Ralph saw that Michael had written his master's thesis on Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. And Ralph thought, a political scientist who would choose to write on a novel would fit in particularly well at a liberal arts college like Carlton. Michael thus gained the opportunity to teach 10 new different courses within the space of two years. Understandably, during that time, he did not manage to write word one of his dissertation. <laughs> but fit in at Carleton, he did. 1968, this will be long history for many of you. The year Michael began teaching at Carleton, was the year both Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were assassinated. And there were violent uh, confrontations between, between police and, and protesters demonstrating in Grant Park outside the Democratic National Presidential Nominating Convention. In an effort to stave off the kinds of student protests that had led not merely to the occupation of the office of the president, but also to the bombing of buildings at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Carlton's dean appointed a select committee of faculty, administrators, trustees, and students to design a new governance system for the college. Although he had just joined the faculty, Michael was asked to serve. You have heard, I am a sober side kind of person. So, I said to Michael, you haven't written word one of your dissertation. <laughs> you were looking forward to having to prepare 10 new courses in the next two years. If you serve on this committee and spend all this time, 
you're not going to be here long enough to be under this governance system that you're helping to design. And let me tell you, these meetings went on forever. Not for the first or the last time. He listened politely, but he didn't take my advice. The temptation to play James Madison, even on such a small scale, was just too strong. Fortunately, Carlson valued, and perhaps still values, service more than scholarly publications. Michael did publish some articles drawn from his dissertation the following decade. However, after he finished his dissertation and was granted a sabbatical leave in 1974-75, he made what he now considers to be the worst professional mistake of his life. Instead of taking his analysis of Locke's first treatise with him to England, where he could have consulted Locke's papers and transformed his dissertation into a book manuscript, he decided to take a break. So he went to England to, to study and write on the 14th Amendment and catch 22. You know, most obvious. We traveled as a family, not only around England and Scotland, but also on the continent and to Greece. Michael learned a lot about architecture and British local history. But as also been announced today, the book on Locke has still to be written. <laughs> By the time we returned to the US and spent a year as visiting professors at Claremont Men's College, preparations for the bicentennial celebrations of the American Revolution and ratification of the US Constitution were underway. And the funding for related projects that then became available is partly responsible for the completion of Michael's two major studies. One, of the development of a theory that led to a new liberal conception of modern republicanism, that's the natural rights and the new republicanism. The other, an account of the debates about the way or ways that theory should be applied in America in the natural rights republic. Michael has still not finished the book or books he provisionally called Completing the Constitution. And he changed the title because he discovered somebody had already written a book under that title. He has published quite a few articles on the development of constitutional theory up to and including um, the, so now my typing's right. Um, the ways in which the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were intended to remedy the major defects James Madison saw in the original. But it seems that the US Constitution, or at least Michael's study of it, is not the sort of thing that can be perfected or completed. One reason why Michael did not complete his work on the US Constitution, or constitutionalism more generally, is that thanks again to the funding for the bicentennial celebrations, his career took a more artistic turn. He and a colleague at St. Olaf initially talked about organizing a tour under the auspices of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, in which they would, in effect, reenact the debates between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson by reading selections from their correspondence. It wasn't clear who was going to play Adams and who was going to play Jefferson, because both Michael and Charles Umbenhauer were tall. Neither of them had red hair, and neither of them was kind of rotund like John. Fortunately, they didn't have to cross that bridge, because they decided instead of staging a reenactment, they would collaborate with the director of the theater program at Carleton, Ruth Wiener, who is here, in writing scripts for a stage play and a nine-part radio series for others to perform. Michael wrote proposals uh, that secured funding for both the writing of the scripts and the production from the National Humanities, sorry, National Endowment for the Humanities. The play entitled Reunion was staged once and only once at Carleton. But the scripts for the nine-part radio series entitled Mr. Jefferson, sorry, Mr. Adams and Mr. Jefferson, were read by professional actors from the Guthrie for the first 20 minutes of every segment 
followed by a 10-minute commentator by the three authors, uh, editors. Unfortunately, none of them kept the master tape. Otherwise, the, theme, the team could have and should have sold the package. Fortunately, a copy of the radio production has been preserved and is still available in the Paley Center for Media, formerly the Museum of Television and Radio in New York City, where they keep and make available what they consider to be the best television and radio productions. Michael's experience as a playwright and scriptwriter then led him to television. He is a man of many skills. <laughs> a producer for the public TV station in the Twin Cities hired Michael to write grant proposals and serve as scholar consultant for what became a seven-part TV series on the American Revolution entitled Liberty, and a series that won the very prestigious Peabody Award. Success breeds success. So Michael was hired to write more grant proposals and serve as a scholarly consultant for three other public TV series, one on Benjamin Franklin, one on Alexander Hamilton, and one um, on contemporary issues in constitutional law. The last featured Peter Sagal of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me fame, riding around on a motorcycle interviewing various groups. Michael's favorite incident in that series has Sable talking to a member of a motorcycle gang who pulls out of his leather jacket his pocket copy of the Constitution <laughs> and says, I carry it with me always so I can tell other people about their rights. Michael taught many fewer courses in public law after he began teaching graduate seminars, first at Fordham and then here at Notre Dame. At both universities, there were other faculty who could teach the basic courses in federalism, separation of powers, and civil rights. But Michael continued to teach, write, and give talks on a wide range of topics. Staples of American political thought, such as constitutionalism, federalism, the Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and the role of the Supreme Court, as well as classic works of political philosophy by Plato, Grotius, Spinoza, Hobbes, Locke, Hume, Thomas Paine, and John Rawls. And he also ventured into the range of literature by publishing essays on several plays by Shakespeare and some on George Orwell, and one on George Orwell. But I think as was mentioned earlier, he also continued to do an extraordinary amount of departmental service. The year after we came to Notre Dame, he was drafted first to serve as DUS, then as interim chair. As a result, in 2002-03, Michael was granted the one and only one paid sabbatical leave he had during our 20 years at Notre Dame. That was to complete the study of the incompletable constitution. In the meantime, the lectures he and I were invited to give on Leo Strauss in Japan while we were visiting scholars at the Liberty Fund in 2003-04 became the basis for the truth about Leo Strauss as the talks and papers we were subsequently invited to give became the basis for the second volume on Leo Strauss and the problem of political philosophy. In 2005, the dean of the college asked Michael to draft the proposal that secured a $1 million three-to-one matching grant from NEH um, to establish the Tocqueville Center for, for, religion, for the Study of Religion and Public Life, and as Philip announced, that first made it possible for the department to hire Philip and then to establish Con Studies. In 2007, Michael was again asked to chair the department, ironically during a year in which he had been granted a leave of absence so that he could teach two courses at the University of Chicago, obvious combination. And in 2008, he supervised the hiring of eight new faculty. That was the year before the recession. Since then, Michael has written a great many more grant proposals to fund lecture series and more expensive and difficult to obtain graduate and postdoctoral fellowships and con studies. 
but he has never written another proposal to secure himself funding for his own research and writing. As a concerned wife, you see I have, I have some rhetorical um, defects, it's clear. I urged him to write the two proposals for external funding sources required to apply for sabbatical leave here. But as I said earlier, he doesn't always take my advice. In this case, he explained that he did not want to leave his program or his students. It is, and I think you've heard this before at this conference, typical of Michael Zuckert that he puts the common enterprise, in this case, the program he worked to found, and his students before any personal or individual interests. And so I think you've heard something about this. One last example would be for the last several years, he has worked on collecting and revising the many essays he has written on James Madison to put together into a book. And he has composed, he has the whole draft of what promises to be a very controversial study of Abraham Lincoln's thought and statesmanship. But he just hasn't been able to find the time to finish those footnotes or to get it quite ready to submit to the publisher because he has repeatedly put his own work aside in order to help, and I was wrong about the number, I guess it's six graduate students who took his Lincoln course, revise and rewrite their papers many, many times in order to produce a publishable volume. A publishable volume. They now have a contract from the University of Kansas Press to publish the collection. But as editor, Michael is still responsible for putting together the final copy and submitting it. Many of you here, I think, know that you have benefited from Michael's extraordinary generosity and dedication, as of course have I. So it is a pleasure as well as a privilege to be able to offer him an expression of our admiration and gratitude, as well as a little bit of the recognition he so richly deserves.